a, a fairly electric memory. So this is one of the emerging non-quantile memories. And this is a brief outline. So first we will review what is the dipole and what is the polarization. And then we will talk about the ferro electric materials. And then we will discuss two representative device structure for the ferro electric memory. One is called ferro electric Redox memory, FE run. And the other one is called ferro electric field effect transistor, FE set. So here first uh, let's have a review of some basic physics. So if you recall your college physics, uh, maybe on the chapter of the electromagnetization, the EM theory of the dielectrics. So here is a basic concept of the dipole. So a dipole is a pair of positive charge and negative charge. So this is like a dipole. And then the dipole will introduce a polarization. So because this is like the direction for the polarization. Or you can think this, you have something like a pair, and then you have positive charge and negative charge separated by certain distance. So this will introduce this polarization. And if you think about the material, like dielectrics, so here, if you have a bulk material, like your oxide, for example, then when you apply external electric field, then the intrinsic dipoles within the material, because the material could be formed by the ionic bond, right? So you have the, let's say, atoms with positive charge, atoms with negative charge, they form the ionic bond. So you can think those as the basis of the dipole. So the principle here is that when you apply the electric field, those dipoles will be lined up respect to the external electric field. Before you apply the electric field, maybe those dipoles are random in the orientation within the dielectric. But once you apply the electric field, they will land up. And you know the field will push positive charge to the right and then attract negative charge to the left in this, in this case. So this is a the basic concept in the dielectric. So in homogeneous linear uh, dielectric, so basically the polarization is proportional to the electric field. And this is uh, the electric field induced polarization. So this is a linear relationship. So you can also think the polarization of this uh, land up dipole is the surface charge. Because here in this bulk material, right, if you look at this, within this dash box, the net charge is neutralized, right? So here within the dash box, they, those charges cancel each other, right? So you have a positive, negative, positive, negative. So in total, the net charge within the box is zero. So only the surface, you see, you have those surface charge. In this example, positive charge on the right, negative charge on the left. So this surface charge is the polarization value of this material. So this P represent the surface charge. And uh, then, how much 
touch is in this volume, right? So you can get the polarization given the like the uh, density of the charges and then the uh, number of charge and also the distance of this surface region. You can get the surface charge, basically the p value. And then the displacement field, if you recall your EM theory, the D is another like a, a quantity. When you describe the, if you recall the uh, Maxwell equation, you have the D, E, this is for the electric, E is the electric field, D is the like displacement field in within the material. And if you recall the Maxwell equation, this is on the electric side. On the magnetization side, you have the B and the H, I believe, like the magnetic field and the magnetization. So the displacement field oops, is the epsilon E plus P by definition. Epsilon zero is the uh, you know the vacuum permittivity times electric field, and then we need to add this surface charge P. So that is the total displacement field within the material, and this can be uh, reformulated with this equation. So one plus how do we pronounce this? Psi. Anyway, this is a Greek letter. So here, this one plus this one actually give you the relative permittivity. So this 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 term is the relative permittivity, and then multiply by the epsilon zero. This is a vacuum, and this uh, relative permittivity is also the dielectric constant we use used to with dielectric constant, right? And then in total, you will get this epsilon E. So the displacement field is proportional to the external electric field. And this coefficient is the vacuum permittivity times the dielectric constant. And for example, we know the value, like silicon dioxide, as we discussed before, is like 3.9, or let's say close to 4. And high K material, like half oxide, with Say so this is like 20, 25. So here basically those dipoles introduce those relative permittivity or dielectric constant within the dielectric material. So this is some you know some basics from the college physics. So why are we interested in this those basics? Because how those dipole uh a land can define the material property we are going to discuss in the next. So basically, here we have the dielectrics. This is a broad class of material. So any material you know, which is a, uh, uh, which is sensitive to the electric field can be described as dielectric. And once you apply field, you introduce dipoles in the material, then this material is called dielectric. And within the dielectric, there is a subcategory called piezoelectrics. So in this case, piezo means when you apply the mechanical force, then you can change the electrical property like those epsilon those values when you have the pressure on the, on the material. So this is also used for many sensor applications. And within the piezoelectrics, there is a subcategory called the pre-electrics. So this is a, when you have the temperature change thermally, you can change the dielectric properties like those epsilon values when you have the temperature. And within this uh, ferroelectrics, there is a subcategory called this ferroelectrics. 
this is the electrical field that induces the changes of those dielectric properties, such as dielectric constants, epsilon, and so on. So here, the basic principle for the ferroelectricity could be described as spontaneous polarization that can be reversed by the electric field. So basically here, for example, here if you have the stifles in this very electric material, when you apply electric field downward in this case, then you know you are going to push the positive charge to the bottom and attract the negative charge to the top. And uh, in normal dielectric, what will happen after you remove the electric field, those dipoles will, will become random. Right, once you remove the electric field, those will be random. Right? After you, you remove the electric field, therefore the net charge at the surface will be zero. The p-value will be zero at the zero field. So that means for dielectric, p equals to zero when the electric field equals to zero. Because those dipoles will be randomized after the field is removed. But for the ferroelectric, after the electric field is removed, then the dipole still maintain this kind of configuration. If, if they maintain this kind of configuration, you will notice that the surface will have the charge. The net charge at the surface is not zero. So you have some p-value. The p-value does not equal to zero when electric field e equals to zero. This is when you remove the electric field. And also, you can reverse this polarization. Uh, if you apply the field the other way, then you are going to flip those domain configuration. Now the positive charge is at the top surface. And when you remove the field, the, the p-value will also be non-zero, but in the opposite polarization. So this is the ferroelectric. So basically, you can think the dielectric, the dipoles will be randomized after you remove the field. But for the ferroelectrics, after you remove the field, the dipole will remain the configuration. When you, uh, uh, the same as when you apply the field, Depend, depending on the direction of the field, they will be aligned up. So any questions here? All right, so next, uh, we are going to discuss the ferroelectric material. So what kind of material will do this kind of ferroelectric property? And before we talk about the real materials, let's talk about some of the models for the ferroelectric. So here, let's start from the single domain model, which is formulated by Landau, which is a well-known physicist. And here, if you think there is a domain pointing up and pointing down, within the material, then the Gibbs free energy of the system can be described using this formula. So the G is a free energy, Gibbs free energy. And it can be represented as a polynomial of the polarization, the p-value, surface charge p-value. And, uh, and also the electric field you applied externally. And here, those coefficients, like this alpha, depends on the temperature. So here you can draw those functions, because this is a polynomial function, you can draw it, the G, free energy, G, respect to the polarization, P. If you draw this function, 
it will be something like if the alpha is smaller than zero, that means temperature is smaller than this T0, and T0 is called the pure temperature. Pure, you know, is uh, the female physicist. Pure temp temperature. So if this is uh, smaller than zero, so this coefficient is smaller than zero, then this polynomial function will be something like a double value shape, double value, two values. And uh, if this alpha is larger than zero, then you will only have this like U shape free energy diagram. So here we call that when alpha larger than zero, or let's say when the temperature is high enough, the ferroelectric material will become this pyroelectric material. But when the temperature is below the Curie temperature, typically at the room temperature, it's below the Curie temperature. Curie temperature for most of those ferroelectric material will be a few hundred degrees C. So typically at room temperature, then we have the ferroelectric double valley shape, uh, double valley curve like this. So what does this mean? This means we have two energy minimal in the diagram that represents the two stable states in the system. One is dipole pointing down, one is dipole pointing up. And uh, then we can derive the E versus P, the relationship, uh, when you make the derivative of the G, uh, G respect to the P, delta, let's say, partial G over partial P equals to zero. And then this equation can be reformulated as this one. It's also a polynomial. And if you draw this curve, the P versus electrical field E from this equation, then it will show something like this. So this is a typical hysteresis curve, hysteresis. Hysteresis uh, curve we show in the ferroelectric uh, so-called PE curve, P versus E. And then here we have those, uh, if you sweep the electric field E, the system will first go from this point. For example, this is like a domain pointing down. And then if your voltage is large enough, the field is large enough, you will trigger the transition. And then the domains will pointing up. And after you remove the electrical field, then this P value will remain a positive value. This is because the domains will remain the, the, the pointing up uh, configuration. And only when you apply negative field, not enough, then you will trigger the flip back to the pointing down state. And uh, here, if you look at from the B to A, if somehow you can manage to stabilize the transition within this S curve, in this region, the P versus E has a negative slope. And P versus E essentially give you capacitance. P, because P you can think is a charge. Field you can think is, is voltage. And capacitance, you know, is a partial Q, partial V. So this part gives the negative differential capacitance. And normally this is unstable because this point corresponds to this energy diagram to this point. This is like the metastable point in the S run. So if the system is in this point, it has it, 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 any uh, perturbation will will flip the system to either to the left or to the right. That means this is not stable. But somehow if you can stabilize that in this region, then you get so-called negative differential capacitance. And if you 
uh, look at the recent literature, there are a lot of discussions on the negative capacitance FET, field effect transistor, negative capacitance transistor, or the NC FET. This is to rely on this uh, negative differential capacitance phenomenon. And our colleague, Professor Asif Khan, in the ECE school, is a pioneer in this uh, negative capacitance research. So I will not go into the details of this negative capacitance, because for memory application, we want to use that. So for memory application, we will rely on the hysteresis, like the, this stable point. We are going to work on the stable point for two memory states. We are not going to position the system to this metastable point. All right, so experimentally, how do you measure the PE hysteresis from the uh, ferri ferrielectric material? So normally, we will need to do this so-called pound measurement. Pound measurement is like this. So basically, when you design the test waveform to the ferrielectric material, you design this triangular shape, a voltage pulse that is represented as the electric field, the black curve. So you have the, the a first the triangle pulse, and then a second triangle pulse goes positive. So this is, this is called positive up. The first one is called positive pulse, second one is called up pulse. And then you reverse the polarity. You have the negative pulse, and then a second down pulse. So what you will need to do experimentally is to apply this waveform to the material, typically like a capacitor kind of structure. Mm -hmm. And then you measure the transient current from the test structure. So the transient current here in this, curve, in this figure is shown as the red curve for the current. So this is a transient current because, you know, the Perinetric is one of the dielectric. The dielectric, you know, in the DC mode, insulating, you only see the transient current, which is due to here two mechanisms. One is the transition switching, the other is the displacement current in the normal dielectric. So anyway, so you will see those currents. So once you have those currents, you need to integrate those currents over time to get the charge. Right, you know the charge, polarization is a charge, surface charge, equals to the integration of the transient current you measure and over the time, right? So this is current you measure and then you integrate over time, then you get the total charge. And then you plot this integrated charge, this polarization value versus the electric field because you ramp up the electric field ramp up first and then ramp down. So it's like you switching up and then a sweep up and sweep down. So what you will see from the first the positive pulse, this pulse, you will generate a curve like this red one in the PE loop. This is the red one. And then this means if the initially if the dipole is pointing down, after the first positive pulse, the dipole will be pointing up. So you flipped the dipole. And this introduced a change of the polarization from the negative PR to the positive PR. So you have the, this switching of the polarization PSW. So this PR value here at zero voltage, this is at zero voltage. This PR value is called the remnant polarization. So this is uh, next to your memory state. At zero voltage, then you still have some like, positive charge to the surface or negative charge at the surface. So this is like your remnant polarization. And then during the positive sweep, then you flip from the negative PR to the positive PR type of sweep from the down to the up state. And then next, you repeat this positive sweep another time. 
now you will only do this pink part. You will see you will see some current here, but this current is pretty small. So this is only the this this part if you do the integration of the charge. So this will give you the so-called displacement charge for the regular uh, capacitor. So think about the capacitor. We are doing the test on a capacitive structure. And this is a ferro material. But first of all, the ferro material, as we showed earlier, is a subcategory of the dielectric. So even you have a normal dielectric, when you apply this kind of a triangular pulse, you will see some like a transient current flowing through the capacitor, right? Remember, the capacitor can conduct the AC current. So that is, that is due to the displacement charge. So the second pulse here basically characterizes the displacement charge. Because in this case, the domain is already uh, uh, flipped. You already flipped. So no more, because you, you, from the first pulse, all the domains already flipped. The second pulse, with the same clarity, will no longer, will no longer flip more domains. So the only current here is due to the displacement current in the second pulse. So in other words, in the first pulse, this positive pulse, we have two types of current contributing to the polarization switching. One is the, the real flipping, polarization flipping or switching due to the domain flipping. The other is that you're charging the capacitor. This is displacement. So my point is that in the first positive pulse, you have two components of the current. One is due to the domain flipping. This is polarization switching. The other component is the regular like a capacitive charging effect due to the displacement current. And then the second pulse will only introduce the displacement current. So what we can do is to use the first pulse minus the second pulse, you will get the black curve here. That is the pure polarization switching. Right. So because you just get rid of the displacement by the subtraction from the first pulse, first positive pulse uh, minus the second up pulse. So we get the black curve. That gives you the intrinsic uh, PE curve. And similarly, you can do the negative side. I will skip the discussions. The negative side, you can also do two pulses. The first pulse, the blue one, will include two components, the polarization switching and the displacement. And then the second one, only displacement. So you minus that, you will get the black curve on the negative side. So you, this is how you get the PE hysteresis using experimental uh, method. And here are a few definitions as we discussed this PR is a remnant polarization and the PS is a maximum or saturation polarization. And then the, here this, this volume, this, this field to trigger the switching is called the EC. This is called coercive field when the polarization equals to zero. So here, this is EC which is like a critical field when you flip from the positive to the negative or from the negative to the positive. So any questions here? Okay, so let's look at another property. This is a small signal CV measurement. You will see a double peak from the ferro electric material. So this testing is a little bit different from the previous one. So this one is not signal flipping. So basically you, you change the voltage and then you measure the current. The voltage next swing 
is pretty large, for example, two to three volts. And then small signal measurement is like you apply, so here you still sweep the voltage from zero, for example, to three volts. But at each step, you apply the AC signal. So it's like a staircase, like ramping up and then ramping down of the voltage. You swing, change from zero to three and back from three to zero. But at each step here, you apply this AC signal, this AC small signal, maybe 10 millivolt, 20 millivolt, to measure the capacitance, to measure the capacitance. And this will give you the capacitance. So in the ferroelectric material, you will see this typical double peak if it's a good ferroelectric material. So here, when you ramp up, you follow the like the uh, blue curve, and at the curse of field, then the capacitance will reach the maximum, and then you will ramp down. And then for, for the negative sweep, you will first start from the red one, and then to the negative uh, curse of field, you reach the maximum, and then the capacitance will decrease. So here, I don't want to go into the details of the physics, but basically, when you are at the curse of field, that is somehow like the domains is like uh, half up and half down, right? If you have multiple domains, as the curve the field, as by definition, the p value equals to zero. So that means you already half flipped the domains because originally all the domains up, you get the positive like pr value, and then as this curve the field the p-value equals to zero. That means you have half up and half down. So at this moment, if you apply AC signal, this domain wall motion will introduce more charges on the surface. And you know the dq over dv give you the char the capacitance, C. So this is uh, like a unstable metastable states, you have more like a domain wall motion, which will introduce more charges for the capacitance. And sometimes from the large signal PE, you can also derive this kind of capacitance versus voltage, but that, that's an incorrect way to do that, because this is from large signal P versus E. Actually, you can also derive a, a double peak using like this kind of curve. Because P is actually Q, right? As we discussed, this is surface charge Q. If you think you use dQ over dE, so basically you take the derivative of this plot, you will also get a double peak. Because here, a derivative means what? Means the slope, right? So at this, this point, which is the like positive e, e, uh, cursor field or the negative cursor field, you have the largest slope that will give you this two double peak. If you do the derivative of this curve, you will get this double peak. You can have the dq over dE or dp over dE versus E. You will get the double peak. But that is uh, not exactly the same as we discussed here. Because this is not simply a mathematical reformulation, but uh, what we describe in this slide is the real measurement of the small signal CV. And the dp over dE is like a large signal of CV. Anyway, we will not go into the details of this one. But my point is that you say the capacitance changes during the region. Okay, so let's talk about some real materials that refer, uh, that exhibit this kind of uh, ferroelectric property. The one of the most uh, well-known uh, material is this PZT, neat, zirconate, antonate. 
And uh, this material has this kind of a crystal structure. So the ferro electric material should be crystalline, at least the polycrystalline material. So it has certain crystal structure. So here, for example, you have three kind of atoms, right? You have P, P is PB actually, is lead. And zirconium, all you know is ZR. Titanium, you know is Ti. So you have three atoms in this uh, crystal. And uh, here, I believe, depending on the location of this atom, this, this green one can be above the plane or below the plane here. So this is polarized because those are ionic bonds. Depending on the location of the this atom, uh, so you can have the dipole up and dipole down. So basically, by displace this atom a little bit by a few angstrom, you will have two configuration. One is dipole up, one is dipole down. By moving the atom a little bit in the crystal structure. And this is called uh, the tetrahedral uh, phase. You have two variants. One is this atom is up, one is this gray atom is down. So that introduces this ferroelectricity in this PZT material. And that corresponds to the, those two stable points in the energy, free energy versus P diagram. And uh, you, you can also get the PE curve. P versus E, right? as we discussed earlier, you have the hysteresis. So basically, uh, during the switching, you are going to lower the barrier towards one side. For example, if you apply positive charge, a positive field, then you are going to lower down the barrier. So it's like this double value. It's going to tilt it like this. So then the system will converge with this state. That means all the dipoles pointing up, that means all of those atoms in this crystal, this particular atom is above the plane. Then I mean it's a half of the crystal. And then you can reverse that. But actually in the experiment, we will notice that this kind of uh, uh, dipole flipping is by the domain switching. Domain means you have certain region of the material that has the same uh, like dipole direction, and we call it a domain. So basically from this experiment, by the piezo force microscopy here, you will notice that initially when you apply the voltage, for example, in this case, all the original dipole pointing up this, this, this area, all of them will have the positive charge at surface, for example. And then when you apply negative voltage, you will partially flip some region. And then when you apply longer and longer negative voltage, then you are going to have more and more domains flipping to the down side. So this is like a domain like uh, growth during the dynamics. So here this is as the schematic as we just described. Initially in this case all the domains up and you apply an active field, then there will be some nucleation. Some domains will first flip and then it will go through this kind of a forward growth, sideways growth and eventually all the domains will flip down. This is because in the fabricated material, you ha will have those domains. It's not homogeneous. You have some variations from region to region. So some regions may flip first. So then this partial switching actually is a good property we can utilize for multi-level memory because depending on how much 
you flip, then you can store different states. And then the PZT actually is a very old material that was discovered maybe tens of years ago with this kind of uh, property. Uh, and the recent uh, discovery of the ferry nitrate halfling oxide actually triggered the interest of the industry. The reason is that PZT, you see, is very complicated. Uh, this lead, the codeine, titanium oxide, right? So then this is a very complicated. Actually, this belongs to the perovskite crystal structure. And uh, this material is not compatible with the CMOS fabrication. So foundries will not use this, basically. But if you can get the half oxide, very nitric, you know, half oxide is already used in the CMOS industry because your high K dinitric or your logic transistor today use the gate stack with half oxide already. So if you can make the half oxide very nitric, then this will be very welcome by the industry, right? So here let's look at the differences between those two uh, two material. So in terms of the epsilon, the dynamic constant, PZT has very high dynamic constant, several hundreds, and halfling oxide maybe 30. And the, the EC, the coercive field, this one is lower, like a, a few hundred kilovolt per centimeter, and the halfling oxide is about like one megavolt per centimeter. But the challenge for the PZT is that you have to make the PZT thin film very thick. So here to, to show this a very electric property, the PZT thickness is to be larger than 70 nanometer or typically larger than 100 nanometer. So it has to be very thick. But half the oxide can be pretty thin, even like seven nanometer you can get this ferroelectric property. So what is the magic to get the half oxide to be ferroelectric? Because as you know, for the normal logic transistor that you've been fed today, your gate stack is already half oxide, but we don't have the ferroelectric property there. Why is that? The reason is that you need to remember this is very important. For the normal logic transistor, high K, your half oxide, is amorphous state. Okay. Amorphous state means you don't have the like a regular like pattern of those. Or in other words, those, those dipoles are randomized. But for the half oxide to get the ferroelectric, you have to have a high temperature allele to make this half oxide some crystal structure, crystalline structure. For example, it needs to show this osmotic phase at high temperature allele, and especially with some dopant to the half oxide, you can trigger it to transition to this crystalline phase, and then you will have this crystal like uh, you know, as we discussed earlier, depending on the location of those atoms, you may introduce some intrinsic dipole into the material. A amorphous phase means that you may have the crystal structure, but they, they are random in terms of the orientation. The, the net charge will be zero. You won't have the polarization for the amorphous half oxide. So only the crystalline half oxide will show this very electric property. So here are some uh, early work from the uh, Lab Lab, which was research institute in Germany, and they first discovered if we dope the half oxide with some silicon, then depending on the like uh, silicon concentration in the half oxide, it may show different crystal structure after high temperature allele, and then if you measure the PE loop as we discussed earlier experimentally, then they can get different properties depending on the concentration of the silicon. So without doping, 
then this is normally like a linear dielectric, the P versus E. This is P versus E. If it's a straight line, then this is like a regular linear dielectric. This is what you use for your high K metal gate in your thin fat. But if you introduce silicon into the half oxide by allylene, then you can get this hysteresis in the PE. Now you can use it as a memory because you have two states, even at zero voltage. Right. And if you keep increasing the silicon concentration, then this will change to so-called antiferroelectric phase. I will not go into two, uh, details of that. Antiferroelectric phase, basically in the PE curve, you will have this kind of this kind of shape is called antiferroelectric. So I will not go into the details of that. And then, then later, the research community has discovered many of the dopants can introduce this hysteresis in the P versus E in the half oxide family. So here, with the zirconium, silicon, or yitrian, and I don't know how to pronounce this one, and then lanthanum, aluminum, GD, what is GD? Anyway, so like uh, there are dozens of materials that you can dope into the half oxide to make it very electric. But of course, different dopants may have slight different property in terms of the PR. We care about the PR value, we care about the EC value. But basically, the Huffman oxide opened a wide opportunity for the industry to engineer the ferroelectric material on a seamless compatible material system, that is Huffman oxide. So here are some more discussions on the endurance behavior. So basically, here when you measure the cycling, right, you, you apply positive pulse, negative pulse, you can repeat that for many cycles. And each cycle, you measure what is the positive PR and what is the negative PR value. Then you can plot the endurance as a function of the cycles. And typically, the, uh, the ferroelectric material will show up this wake-up process. That means initially, the PR value is kind of small. And but with the cycling, then you have a wider like, uh, PR window between the positive side and negative side. But if you keep increasing the pulse number, then eventually this will experience so-called fatigue uh, process. And then the PR value will decrease, and eventually you may see a breakdown, a dielectric breakdown of the capacitor. So this is typical endurance test. And also, here we can briefly discuss why we have this endurance change over the cycles. So because initially you may have some domains are pinned by the surface charge because of the uh, imperfect fabrication. So some of the surface may have some defect that will pin some of the domains. So not all the domains, all the dipoles are flipping in the initial state or the pristine state. So the PR value is kind of small. But as you cycle it many times, so those like uh, interface defects uh, migrate, or you, you recover some of the defects, then all the domains are like released. So you can flip all of them, then your PR value is large. And eventually, when you cycle many times, because you apply the electrical field, that will create the additional defects in the dielectric. And this additional defect may pin some of those domains. So those domains are not switchable. So then the PR value will reduce. So this is how it, the PR value goes up and then comes down. So here are more like uh, uh, examples doing this kind of uh, wake up and uh, fatigue process. So there are different kinds of materials as we discussed earlier, So, but they have different trade-offs in terms of endurance versus the PR value. So this is still an active research area. And the best uh, 
factory endurance number reported in the loop toxin oxide system is about 10 to 11 to 10 to 12 cycles. All right, so the last part, we talk about how we integrate this parametric into a memory device. So here are two structures for the ferrinetric memories. The first one is called FE-FET, the second one is called uh, FE-RUN. So here the difference is that in the FE-FET, this is, is a transistor structure. Ferrinetric field effect transistor is a FET, next to MOSFET. So the only difference is that in the gate stack, we add this ferrinetric material as one layer of the gate stack. So this transistor becomes a ferro transistor or FE FET. And the principle is uh, very similar as your patch trap flash transistor. So basically, if you have the dipoles pointing down or pointing up, that will change the threshold voltage. Of your transistor. So if you look at the drain current versus the gate voltage IDVG curve, if the other domains are pointing down, then you have a low threshold voltage. This is in log scale, you know, the threshold voltage is somewhere here, this is VT low. And then if you have the dipoles all dipoles up, then you have the VTH high. So this is like your memory window. Very similar like flash transistor. To change the threshold voltage and therefore then at the even read voltage if you fix the gate voltage somewhere here then when you read out the drain current you can think this is the memory state one and this the other one is memory state zero right because you have different readout currents of those two states so this is fe fat and then fe run the ferrinetric material is added to the drain of the transistor. Basically, here you add a capacitor, ferrinetric capacitor, two terminal capacitor to the drain compact. And then when you read out, you apply voltage, the VPL, this is plate, this, this electrode is called plate. So the VPL, if the, the VPL is a positive large voltage and uh, depending on the polarization you will either read out a large current from the plate or small current from the plate the reason is that if you if let's say you have two states right pointing up and pointing down if you are pointing down and then the voltage now let's say if you are pointing up initially, you have a positive voltage here, then you are going to flip this down. So this flipping will introduce a large current as we discussed earlier. You need to apply this polarization switching current. So that is how you read, up, read out this state. The other state is that you already have the dipole pointing down. Then when you apply positive voltage here, then you only have the displacement current. You, you won't flip. If you flip, you need to apply additional charges to flip that. But it's already pointing down, so you only have the displacement charge. Therefore, the readout current is small. So by sensing the current, you can detect which state you store in the memory. So this is called FE run, very natural random access memory. Because this is very like, uh, let's say, a D run, right? one T1C, you have a transistor and you have a capacitor, right? It's like a D run. So this is called FE run. So let's talk about FE run first. Because FE run actually has already been commercialized uh, like 20 years ago. So most of the material actually is based on the PZT for the commercially available FE run. So here are some history. And uh, in early 2000s, the many like products, 
for the FE run, and most of that is used in those smart card or your hotel key. So this is basically the FE run. And uh, uh, typical size is like uh, 100 kilo, kilobytes, and then that's 250 kilobytes or one megabyte in that range. And uh, mostly uh, by those companies, uh, or like uh, today's, and like uh, Cypress, I believe. And I will discuss that later. But this is the history of this FE run based on the PZT and the interest of the FE run uh, with the PZT, I would say the peak of the interest is around 2000. Because this is, can be very low cost for those, you know, this smart card. So, but if you look at the differences between D run and FE run, there are some differences, although this is 1T1C. Uh, this C is a ferroelectric fer capacitor, and the D run is a regular dielectric capacitor. Right? So the capacitor is different, and uh, the difference is that FE run is a number of memory because you, you, the, those dipoles will remain will, will will retain after you remove the voltage, right? so you can keep that state for a long time. But the FE run will have some requirements for the red back. I will discuss in a minute. But since it's number tile, so you don't need to do the refresh. Right? In D run, you know, we have to do re refresh. But FE run with the PZT in the commercial product uh, stopped the scaling around 130 nanometer. This is because the PZT, as we discussed earlier, is very thick. You need more than 100 nanometer to show this ferroelectric property. So that's vertically you need 100 nanometer. Horizontally, you also need more larger than 100 nanometer. Then this cannot scale, basically. This PZT is a very large material. But anyway, let's look at the waveform to read the FE run out. So here, this is uh, the PE curve, and then we have two, two read out current depending on the state. So when you design the waveform, you have to do it this way. So for example, for the word line, of course, you need to turn on the word line because word line controls the transistor, 1T1C. And then initially, let's say you have the 1T1C, you have this capacitor. This is the plate. So here, initially, for example, if you think this is the pointing down, pointing down. So you apply positive voltage to the, this is BL. You apply positive voltage to the plate. Oops. Positive voltage to the plate. And that will trigger the flipping. It's like the positive voltage here. So it will trigger the oops, this is bad. trigger the flipping from the down to the up because you apply positive voltage. So you will have this large readout current of reading one because this involves the switching of the cycle. But after that, you notice that. If you do nothing, okay, the memory state will remain on the data zero. This is not what you want. Because in the read, you don't want to change the data. So that means you have to write back. So this write back is important. Or rewrite is important. So you have to design the waveform first in this half cycle. The plate line is the is positive. And in the next half cycle, you have to make the plate line zero. Meanwhile, the bit line now become one. So effectively, you have negative voltage across this cap, because now the bit line is positive and plate is zero. So the negative 
voltage applied to this cap. That will trigger this back flipping from the 0 to 1. So at the end of the cycle, so you go back to the 1 stage. So you have to rewrite, otherwise after the read, you will change the data. So the FE run, a unique feature is that you have to do the rewrite. Uh, in the DRAM, we also have the write back, but DRAM is simpler because DRAM, the sense amp, will automatically char recharge the cap. But in this case, we have to intentionally apply elective voltage to write it back. So we have to carefully design the waveform. So here, for the rate zero, then nothing will happen. So you don't need to re rewrite. Even you design the waveform the same way uh, because you don't know the data and before you read, you have to design the waveform the same way. But nothing will happen because read zero will not flip. We will only have the displace displacement current. And for the right, then this is the, the waveform for the right. I will skip the details. And for the right, basically it's the same, uh, straightforward. You have to basically flip the domains from down to up by applying positive voltage on the plate and the ground the bit line. And then the other way is, uh, you know, apply the voltage, reverse the voltage polarity. So you can you can look at this waveform and figure out this how this is switched. So here, FE run, the major market is to replace the low flash. And uh, uh, here, the, those are the two companies that uh, still offer the FE run product. One is Cypress, the other one is the Fujitsu. So here you see the matrix, FE run versus the 2D no flash. Uh, the read time is pretty is similar, and read time could be much faster than the no flash. No flash, you know, the channel holds electron and we need like tens of microseconds. And then the red voltage also smaller than the low flash. Flash, you know, needs more than 10 volts. And this one, like two to three volts. And also the endurance is much better. So you can cycle like 10 to 12 cycles and flash, we know, less than 10 to the fifth cycle. And the red energy is also lower, especially compared to no flash, channel hot electron, and like 10 picojoule to red per bit. So this one, I would say uh, maybe up to 100 picojoule. At least uh, one order lower uh, red energy. So it looks pretty uh, good compared to the 2D no flash. But the challenge is that here, those are in 130 nanometer load. And 2D no flash has been scaled to 40 nanometer. So then, still, the FE run needs to scale to similar technology load to provide enough density to compete with 2D no flash. But, but from the property you see here, it's pretty promising. So here, the industry, as I said earlier, in uh, next the half oxide system for the better scalability. Uh, so here, uh, Sony recently demonstrated the half in the Cone oxide FE run 64 kilobit at 130 nanometer. And uh, here is the recent paper. I will skip the details. But still, this is a planar HZO capacitor at the uh, back end. So this is like 130 nanometer. If we want to move to more advanced technology node, we have to, if this is only like 40 nanometer or even 28 nanometer, let's say 28 nanometer, then we have to make this capacitor like a cylinder, like the DRAM, as we discussed before, to provide enough without current. So to scale to more advanced node, a cylinder cap is needed. But this is possible with hafnium oxide, because hafnium oxide, which is this green part, can be 5 nanometer thick. 5 nanometer thick, the half in oxide. This, which is possible. But if you do the PZT, then it's impossible. The PZT, you know, is more than 100 nanometer. How can you fit that into a cylinder with diameter only 28 nanometer? But with the 5 nanometer half in oxide based ferrinatrix, 
this is possible. But still, the research needs to be done and development needs to be done by the company. This is very recent result. And uh, in the last part, we are going to talk about the FE FET. So this is a similar as the IK metal gate. The only difference is that you need to increase the thickness of the toughening oxide a little bit, and then do the alleling, and then this becomes a FE FET. So very similar fabrication process as a logic IK metal gate transistor. The only difference is that you have to anneal the hafnium oxide and dope the hafnium oxide a little bit. So here you can look at the principle, right? So if your dipoles are pointing down, then let me see. If the dipoles are pointing down, let's say you have higher or smaller threshold voltage. How do you think? If the dipoles are pointing down, so dipoles are pointing down. So basically, you will have a sorry. Pointing down means dipoles are pointing down. So basically, your panel electron will be easier to be inverted, right? Because you have positive charge near the surface of the channel. So it's easier to flip or invert the channel. This is all MOS. So here when we talk about the FE FET, it's all MOS transistor. So the channel is P-type. And to turn on the channel, you know, you need to invert the channel to induce the electrons. If you have positive dipole, that's a positive charge close to the channel, then it's easier to turn on the channel. That means the VTH is low. On the other side, if you have a negative charge to the channel, then this will repel the channel inverted electron. So it's more difficult to turn on the channel Then you have a high VTH state. So here, when you see the ID versus VG, then this is like the pointing down and this is like pointing up to state. And actually, when you sweep the voltage, you, you can apply positive voltage to push down the... Uh, you, if you apply positive voltage, then you are going to push down the dipole. So the switching here is clockwise, sorry, counterclockwise, counterclockwise. Or in other words, let's say you apply positive gate voltage, positive gate voltage, you are going to push down the dipole, and that will result in a VTH no. And if you apply negative voltage, you are going to flip up dipole, that will result in a VTH high. So here you need to be careful about the direction of the situation because if you if I ask you what is the direction for the catch trap or let's say flash floating gate transistor, you have opposite switching. For the floating gate transistor or the flash, if you recall, you when you apply positive voltage on your floating gate, you are going to attract more electrons to the floating gate. You are going to have higher threshold voltage. So for, for that one, this is exactly the opposite. So you need to be careful. For the, let's, let, let me emphasize one more time. For floating gate transistor or the flash transistor, it has a so-called clockwise switching. Positive voltage increases the VTH. And in this case, positive voltage decreases the VTH. But other than that, then the readout mechanism is very similar. The only difference is the switching direction. And the global foundry has uh, already demonstrated the FE FET at their 28 nanometer platform. So here are the uh, results. Uh, you can see that compared to the normal high metal gate, the only difference is that here a little thick compared to this one. So here you add the silicon doped half oxide as a ferroelectric heat stack. And it has this IDVG curve for the low VTH state, high VTH state. So you have this memory window. 
and then it shows next to power 5 to the power 6 switching cycle endurance and also retention at 120, uh, 105 degrees C. And if you measure the PE or PV from the gate stack, you will get decent PR value around like 20 microcoulomb per centimeter square. And the, e, uh, the EC is about 1 megavolt per centimeter. Per centimeter. So this is uh, uh, the global foundries uh, test array, 64 kilobit FE FET array. And uh, you can program the arrays in positive and negative 4.5 volts and uh, switching uh, write speed less than 500 nanoseconds, read time less than 25 nanoseconds, and the endurance is about 25 cycles. So this is already integrated in 28 nanometer platform. And later, Glow Foundry further improved the scaling. This is on a 22 nanometer FDS OI platform. It integrates the ferro or dianetric compared to the regular logic transistor. You see a little bit different here. So this stack has additional like the silicon doped half oxide, a little thicker. But other than that, the process is very similar. So this is very compatible with advanced technology. And here again, this is a memory window, 1.5 volts, the low VTH, high VTH, and this is a counterclockwise switching. And uh, then further, Global Foundry integrated into a larger array, like 32 megabit array, and this is a checkerboard pattern. You can program as you wish. And then this uh, uh, property is improved, like the Switching time reduced to like 10 nanoseconds. But endurance still limited by like 10 to the power of 5 cycles. So let's briefly talk about what limits the endurance in the FE FET switching. So basically, in the FE FET, there is a, an interfacial layer. So when you fabricate the FE FET, so you have a silicon channel. And then here you have, we have some silicon dioxide as the interface. And then you have the, for example, your half oxide, for example, silicon doped half oxide as a ferro layer, and you have a metal gate, metal gate. So here, this interfacial layer will cause the trouble because from the energy diagram point of view, the interfacial layer, the silicon dioxide, if the epsilon is about four, dielectric constant is about four, and this is about like 20 to 25. So from the capacitor divider point of view, you have basically two capacitors. Here one is the ferro capacitor, one is the silicon dioxide capacitor. So larger dielectric constant actually means smaller, oh sorry, larger cap here, but from the capacitor divider point of view, more voltage will drop on this one. So that means most of voltage actually drop on the interface, not on the ferro to switch. So that means here the slope is steeper, that means many of the voltage drop on here, it will generate the defect at the interface. That will cause the degradation of the endurance, and also this may introduce the charge trap. So sometimes this is also similar as a flash transistor. Sometimes you, you, you this counterclockwise and clockwise solution will compete with each other. Because when you apply positive voltage, you also attract the charge into the gate stack, similarly as your flash transistor. So the touch trapping and the polarization switching will compete with each other, compete. And uh, also there is a depolarization field impact the retention. So after you flip the domains, because you have this interfacial layer, so that will attract the negative charge. And this negative charge and positive charge, they will introduce a reverse field to flip back the domains. That will impact the retention. So this is another limitation of the FE FET. I will not go into the details due to the time limits here. And also it may suffer from the variation because here you have many domains and then if you cannot flip all of them, then that will introduce the VTH variation between the program and erased states. 
But here, the active fat has one property that we can use for the Martin level cell, because here the domain, if you partially flip, then you can gradually tune the threshold voltage. Similarly, as your flash, right, you can control how many electrons inject to the floating gate, so you can tune the threshold voltage. So here, you can control how much portion of those domains flip, therefore you can control the threshold voltage. In this case, you can have multi-level states. In this case, four levels, two bits. Okay, so this is a summary. We talk about the ferrimetrics today. And uh, here the key message is that the double tapping site makes the ferrimetric compatible with the CMOS fabrication. That's why this got a lot of interest today from the industry. All the companies are investing in the ferrimetrics. And uh, two types of the ferrimetric memory. One is FE run. It has a destructive read. But endurance could be high. The FE FET is more compatible with the advanced logic transistor process, but it needs to overcome the challenges as we discussed earlier, the interfacial layer depolarization and the variation. And also FE FET can do multi-level sale. And similar as flash, and also FE FET can be potentially integrated into the 3D NAND architecture, because here if you recall the 3D NAND, the Touch trap layer is deposited on the pinner, the vertical pinner. So here you can also deposit the ferroelectric material on the pinner. Therefore, you can build a 3D land structure. So here, ferroelectric memory has drawn recent interest from both academia and industry, and could be the next breakthrough of the non-volatile memory technology. And uh, actually, our group and also Professor Asset Kong's group are actively working together on the ferro electric uh, devices at Georgia Tech. All right, so that's for today's lecture. So any questions? If not, then we will stop here today. Thank you.